Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul Dykeman. This video outlines the final year project I've been working on for the duration of 2018 called the Automatic Optical Polarization Controller. I'd like to first start off by thanking Arthur Lowry for supervising me this past year, Bill Corrigan for assisting with laboratory equipment, Tim Felipper for ordering parts, and Rob Jackal for helping manufacture the body and gears. The proposed project was to develop an automated solution for maintaining a fixed polarization state in a fiber optic cable. To first understand how this device works, we must look into polarized light and the effects of biofringence. Fiber optic cables carry communication signals in the form of light particles, or photons. This is generated from pulsating LEDs, or lasers. The most basic fiber cable is comprised of many different layers, such as the core, cladding, buffer, and jacket. The core has a high refractive index and is the transmission area of the fiber and is made from a mixture of pure glass and plastic polymers. The cladding is another glass layer, which surrounds the core with a lower refractive index. The core and cladding combination act as a mirror via phenomena known as total internal reflection, allowing light to propagate through twists and bends. Light is an electromagnetic wave and consists of two orthogonal electric field components that vary in amplitude and phase. Let's call these two modes vertical and horizontal polarization. The two electric field components oscillate perpendicular to the direction of propagation. If this electric field fluctuates randomly in time, it is considered unpolarized. Sources like sunlight, halogen, LEDs produce unpolarized light. When light is polarized, these two components propagate with a specific phase and amplitude. We can classify polarized light into three types. When light is linearly polarized, the electric field is confined to a single plane along the direction of propagation. This can be horizontal or vertical. If the two linear components are perpendicular to each other, meaning they are equal in amplitude but have a phase difference of 90 degrees, the resulting electric field rotates in a circle around the direction of propagation. Depending on the rotation, it can be classified as left or right circularly polarized light. If the components have a phase difference that is not 90 degrees, it can be classified as elliptically polarized. All of these states can be represented on a graphical tool called the Poincare sphere. As you can see, linear polarization states are represented by the equators, whilst the upper and lower poles represent the right-hand and left-hand circular polarization states. All other states on this sphere are elliptical. Ideally, polarized light should maintain its phase and group velocity during propagation. This would require the fiber's cross-sectional core to be perfectly circular in symmetry. However, factors such as temperature variations, bending, twisting, alter this cross-sectional shape and change the polarization state. This can be defined as biofringence. A simple example of residual biofringence can be seen in this plastic CD case, where the stress areas form an imperfect surface altering the propagation of polarized light. Manual polarization controllers attempt to exploit the use of stress-induced biofringence. A popular type of polarization controller induces stress by using coils of fiber in a sequence. By adjusting the orientation of these three coils, the cable twists and one can transform an input state into any output state polarization. This one here costs about $230 and is one of the cheapest products on the market. This will be used as my total cost benchmark. Others can increase up to $2,000 or more depending on the accuracy and control of the device, so you can understand the need for a cost-effective alternative. The device I have created replicates the cheaper three-paddle manual polarization controller. It focuses on being a pre-made kit that you can print and assemble yourself out of minimal parts. Motors will autonomously rotate these paddles through an acrylic servo gear mechanism, twisting the cable to maintain a fixed linear state polarization. So how do we use these two field components to maintain a polarization state in this device? First, a DC power supply is attached to the device using banana jacks. Then, a single mode jacked fiber is loaded into the paddles of the device. This is connected to a negative 10 dBm lasers output. When the device first turns on, both LEDs will illuminate. 
by pressing the red loading button, the servos will align and a cable can be loaded. As you can see, the special gear design allows cables to be removed and installed without disassembly. This state is also used for aligning the servo and paddles when the lid is attached during construction. Covers on the paddle should be used to hold down the spools of fiber, firmly minimizing unwanted biofringence. To assess each electrical field component, the cable is then connected to a two axis polarization beam splitter. The light is then split into two arbitrary axes. One axis can be denoted as the horizontal component and is connected to the device forming its embedded feedback. By pressing the green button, the device will enter the tune state, monitoring the optical power on the horizontal axis connected to the device. By switching the device off, we can operate it manually. The other arbitrary axis can be denoted as the vertical component, which can be measured using an optical power meter. If the horizontal component is nulled, then the light is linearly polarized in the arbitrary vertical axis. This axis can then be attached to a modulator for optical communication or laboratory experiments. Now that we understand how this device works, we can explore the design objectives I proposed in semester one. For starters, we know that the controller needed to be less than $230. The steps for manufacturing it would need to be incredibly simple, requiring basic tools like a screwdriver and soldering iron. The body needs to be manufactured using university equipment and parts available within a few days shipping around Australia. It needed to weigh under one kilogram, whilst being robust, durable, and protective of circuitry encased inside of it. If the device ever broke, I wanted the shell to be recyclable so that it could be disposed in an eco-friendly manner. But most importantly, a solution was needed to load the cable without the need for disassembly. For the hardware, the user interface needed to be simplistic, where a DC power supply can be connected, powering the device activated by a switch. It would need to incorporate two buttons with a colored LED to indicate its current state. One button would operate the loading state and indicate red. The other would operate the tuning state and indicate green. An amplifier and photodiode needed to be designed to accommodate a negative 10 dBm laser using an FC type connector to measure optical power. For the software, it needed to consider several modes of operation, a tuning state and a loading state activated by pressing a button. A release state could also be incorporated for manual tuning purposes, whereby the paddles freely rotate. Lastly, a hold state for when the user is happy with its position, the servos will freeze in the last known position. To complete the project on time, I initially created a flowchart which considered the design phases for the year. This was then made into a Gantt chart which considered all the tasks required to complete the project on time. Each light blue square represents one week of the semester allocated to a specific task. These tasks have a start and finishing time and are the building blocks for completing each objective in the project. As you can see, there are sections allocated for a literature review, modeling, prototyping, testing, and finalizing the product. I will use this to assess my progress later in the video. In the first phase, an initial CAD prototype was created to simulate how the paddles could be autonomously rotated using servos and an Arduino Uno. 3D printing was found to be the best method to manufacture the body, being highly accurate when printed, available at most universities, and relatively cheap. PLA filament could be used as an eco-friendly method for designing a recyclable structure since it's made from cornstarch. For the gears, acrylic laser cutting machines on campus provided even more precision when producing two-dimensional shapes. This was important since I needed gears to mesh properly. A schematic was designed to consider all the hardware needed to perform its function. This consisted of a regulator to power the Arduino and a power converter to supply the three servos. A photodiode was used to convert the optical signal into current. This current was then processed by a trans impedance amplifier for the input of the Arduino analog pin. The two LEDs are controlled by the digital output pins, which respond based on the voltage received from the buttons that are pressed. Unfortunately, when it came time to printing the prototype, the build envelope for the 3D printers on campus were too small. With semester one deadlines approaching, I quickly reduced the design to a two-paddle prototype. This was not ideal for the first prototype, 
However, it gave some insight for the final construction. Screws were found difficult to thread, so the tolerance for holes needed to be adjusted. The 3D printer constraint meant that the microcontroller and servos needed to be reduced in size. Hand drilling locations for the user interface and display would be too difficult, so pre-made locations should be incorporated into the body. A location for fastening the circuitry was not considered well enough, and routing cables for the servos caused issues with the gears. On the positive side, it validated that 3D printing provided a strong, durable structure for the body, cover, and paddles. It proved that servos can accurately align to control paddles using an acrylic gear train. Lastly, proof of concept. Where the product can be assembled like a kit, being manufactured entirely on campus and able to induce biofringence. The total cost for the prototype came in at $260.10. This was improved in the final design since the new microcontroller and servos were cheaper, resulting in a total cost of $220.32 for the final construction, lower than the $230 benchmark. When it came to remodeling the final design, I considered all the failures from my prototype, resizing every hole for the screws to perfectly fasten components. On the front and side, there are pre-made locations for the user interface. As you can see, I've designed an opening for the Arduino Nano's micro USB port. That way, it can be reprogrammed without removing the circuit board. Above, there is a connector for the fiber optic cable input. I modeled the circuit board to calculate the exact holes and sizing for the strip board. The servos were mounted in a precise location for gear train alignment. The larger gear was redesigned with two extra mounting holes to attach the servo arm. The smaller gear was kept the same, with a unique slot to attach to the paddle without obstructing the loading position. The paddle, however, was reduced in size. On the rear, the power converter can be mounted and the cabling can be routed through a small recess in the body and lid. These router cables are then held back by several shields. If there is excess length, they can be wrapped around these shields. As you can see, the strip board fits perfectly into its location and the interface cabling is plugged in. The interface cabling were pre-soldered female and male jumper cables so that they could be removed if necessary. This final GAN chart represents the total progress I have achieved over the course of the year. As you can see, I never fully finished the testing. Many delays in building hardware and printing components led to the programming of a functioning tune state unsatisfied. As you saw in the video, I also accidentally fried two servos. This unfortunately led to the final design never being fully trialed. If the project continued further, I would have loved to see the following happen. A fully implemented tuning algorithm which can be used for another revised design. In the revised design, the circuitry and interface could be soldered onto PCB, further reducing the steps to assemble the device. For the body, an extra clamp to hold down cabling at each end would be ideal. As you can see, I had to use tape. Lastly, I would greatly improve the gearing. One method would be to use stepper motors. The 2 to 1 gear ratio was initially designed to increase the 180 degree movement from a servo to a 360 degree rotation in the paddles. The problem with this is it halved the resolution of the servos. If stepper motors were used, the device could be much more precise when tuning and the gear ratio could be reduced. If this gear ratio is reduced, the height of the body can be shorter. Lastly, the gear's backlash would need to be rectified. The small amount of backlash in the gear train caused small DBM fluctuations. When you multiply this by three paddles, it makes a huge dif difference. To rectify this problem, two back-to-back -back helical gears can be used which are slightly offset. One gear would provide clockwise rotational movement, whilst the other offset gear would drive the anti-clockwise rotation, reducing this small free play. Thank you for listening to my final year project presentation on the automatic optical polarization controller. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me.